Uh, welcome to another edition of the GM Files. Jim get alongside Bobby Evans, and we are happy to be alongside longtime Major Leaguer Nick Swisher. Nick, what's going on, man? We need uh, we need some good stories from you. You, you got it, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I think this is going to be awesome, man. I'm happy to be here. All right, cool. So let me start off. Uh, uh, we were talking about this before we came on, but but going back, let's go back to your, your amateur years, Ohio State, right? I remember you. Uh, your dad and I have known each other for a long time, and he used to talk about how your your playing ability as a high schooler there in West Virginia, Parkersburg High School. Yes, sir. Yes, Parkersburg sir. High School. All right, so my memory's still good. Uh, you go and you don't get drafted. Thirty, well, I don't know at that time. There's probably twenty six teams passed you by. Right? They missed. They missed out on you. You go to Ohio State, and you end up becoming a number one pick, which is yeah. incredible. Right? The, the the years that you had there, we almost drafted you with the Mets. Uh, right ahead of where you went with the Oakland A's. Do you remember where the Mets on your radar are at all or, uh, before you saw them take uh, Scott Casper? Oh, hell yeah, man. I mean, the big apple. I mean, come on, you know, like I knew where all those teams were. I knew where everybody was. It was just, you know, because that was such a, uh, a culmination of so much just time and work and effort and just overall blood, sweat and tears to get to that point, listen, man, like coming out of high school, I thought I was a pretty good, I thought I was a pretty good baseball player, but a lot of people didn't see that. So you can take that one of two ways. All right. Well, I can either shut it down and, and not believe in myself, or I don't know, bro. I, I got that chip over here. You know, it's like, I, I wanted to prove everybody wrong. And so I think that was one of the greatest things that I've ever been able to accomplish in my life is going from a non-drafted off the board guy to a first round draft pick. Like that's something that I hold really, really close to the chest because that just, the stuff like that doesn't just happen. You know, it's not like you, know, you don't just miss over guys like that. You have to really make yourself. And, and I was able to, you know, have the grit and the grime and the, and the, and the love to do it. But I'll never forget the night before. Uh, I don't know if many people know this, that, uh, you know, I had received a phone call uh, from Billy Bean and it was kind of one of those conversations that like, Hey, listen, um, you know, we've got you high on our board and, you know, if you're there at 16, uh, we're going to take you. We want you part of the Oakland A's. And so I'm like, are you kidding me? Bro? Like, I'm thinking to myself, like I'm 21 years old. I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I, I knew how much money the guys made the year before. I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me, bro? I, I, I don't have enough money for lunch money. And you're going to, all of a sudden I'm going to have this sort of money. It was uh, such a crazy moment. And I'll never forget the draft day comes along. Now that was you know, before it was all on TV and, you know, right, right. you had to get on the internet and, you know, she were in Parkersburg. That wasn't exactly up our alley at the time, you know, <laughs> you know, too. And I'll just never forget. I remember kind of my dad being in the kitchen with me and we put the, you know, the house phone right there on the table, the kitchen table yeah. Yeah. and just waiting for that phone to ring. But we didn't really know time wise who was drafting, you know, we like, Time just felt like it was like, man, this is something's wrong. Like no one's called us. And it's been like five hours. So the next thing you know, my dad goes up. He's like, you know what? I got to take a shower. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm just going to, you know, I'm sitting here by myself. Like no one's here. Next thing you know, I couldn't, I, I can't, you couldn't even script this. As soon as I hear the shower turn on, bang, the phone rings, right? Here it is. It's Billy. Nick, hey, congratulations. You know, we drafted you. You know, at oh, what was it? Uh, yeah, at 16 or 6, 17 16. in that year, right? 16. Yeah, yeah you're right. And yeah. I was just kind of like going nuts because I, I was trying to be as I'm off the walls, but I'm so I'm very respectful and I'm always, you know, like, right. so it's Billy Bean on the phone. I'm like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, you know, yes, sir. I, I'm so honored. It's such a great opportunity, right? And I'm trying to get off the phone as fast as I can because all I want to do is hug somebody, right? That's all I want to do is just like, get on somebody and no one's there right so i get off the phone with him all of a sudden you know my dad he's a oh, big man goodness. he's coming down the stairs sounds like an elephant's coming down the stairs right so then all of a sudden we meet in the kitchen he had he had nothing but a towel on and it was like the biggest like chest bump embrace like crying moment because it was like wow man like you put all that effort in and it really just goes to show you if you believe in yourself and you put all that effort moving forward and you have your mind, body, everything moving in the right direction, like you can do some very special things. And I was very blessed to have that as a stepping stone moving forward. So I a hey, Oakland A's, Milwaukee Brewers, Giants, bro. I didn't care. Like it was the chance to like play at the next level. And that's all I really wanted to do was just continue to keep that jersey on as long as you can. Because when they take it off, 
it's really hard to put it back on, you know. And you, then you you get, you get into the A system. I mean, and of course, at that time, Billy Billy has really transformed how the A's are doing business and really kind of awakened baseball to a lot of a lot of what we see today. But you know, quietly clubs were doing what they did, but Billy Billy had had made a, a concerted effort that was really you know really even beyond what a lot of clubs were doing. You you kind of were against the grain of 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 that in the sense that you know yet you were a plate discipline guy, but at the same time the draft pick didn't necessarily you know play into you know Billy's kind of math math models per se. But then not only you drafted what no two, and then in two thousand four you make your major league debut. I mean that that's a pretty quick rise through the system. Yeah, you know I think I was lucky. Uh, I think I was lucky to be drafted by an organization that appreciated kind of the now, right? A really appreciated. Um, you know, guys that really worked and, 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 and were successful because the thing in the Oakland A's organization, at least in the early 2000s, was, listen, baby, you play well, you're moving up. And that's such a great thing to have as a young yeah. player because it always keeps you hungry. And I'll never forget, we had that rule in the minor leagues. You had, every one, you had to walk one time for every 10 at-bats to, to move up the ladder. Well, like, bro, I was walking like 20 times a month. I was like, this is like the easiest thing I've ever done, right? But I, I think for myself, being able to have a guy like Billy Bean to kind of like look at the game in a little different light, uh, I thought that was so amazing. And, and we were so honored and blessed to be part of that 2002 draft class, which obviously now the Moneyball draft, uh, which was awesome to be part of all that. Listen, man, we had people following us around, like writing about us, like it felt good. It was cool yeah. to kind of be uh, uh, maybe like an outlier at that time because, you know, I mean, it wasn't you know, as big of a part of a game as right. Billy was making it. But at the right. end of the day, look at what happened in that 2002 run the big league squad had. I mean, they right. rattled off 20 in a row. I mean, you had some – it was like the land of misfit toys at the time if you look at that <laughs> roster. Uh, and so for us, we were like, you know what? Hell yeah, man. We want to be part of that squad because I also think – you know, now kind of, you know, being a, you know, a special advisor with the Yankees, it's a little different. It's very buttoned up. But I, I liked one of the one things about being in Oakland A in the minor leagues is they, they weren't on top of you. They weren't telling you what to do. They weren't telling you how to wear your jersey. They weren't, you know, on you about the length of your hair. Listen, we were all trying to be like Jason Giambi at the time. I mean, he had the long <laughs> hair, bro. He had the biceps, right. like the whole nine. And that was the guy that we all wanted to be. So, Throughout that minor league run, I mean, we weren't really signing many baseball cards. We were signing books. You know, we yeah. weren't going to sign on the inside of books, which was crazy because I can't remember the last <laughs> book I've read cover to cover, you know? So I think just in general, I was so blessed to be part of that because it was awesome. It was something different. And I've always kind of prided myself on always being myself and not trying to conform to some other way. So to be able to be part of that book and to let them know that, you don't necessarily have to be a certain way to be sick. You can look at it in other lights. And Billy Bean really kind of opened that up to a lot of people. I mean, if you look at that draft class, we had seven first round draft picks. And yeah. I think, you know, four of them made it to the show for a hot minute, which I think is impressive. You know, no I mean, question. especially knowing what I know about, you know, drafting and scouting now, I mean, like, that's a pretty good uh, return on your investment, no doubt. It, it is. It is. It, so, all right. You said you were part, obviously you were part of the book, and there's a there was a movie came out of that too, right? So, so any any good stories out of that? Did, did uh, you know was Brad Pitt coming down? You have yeah, a bunch of Brad Pitt or anything bro, like let, that? Let me tell you this. I knew this, and Billy would be the first one to tell you, man. Like when Brad Pitt took over Billy Bean's role, we were all like, "Oh no, we're out. They're not bringing us in, bro. This ain't gonna be about us. It's gonna be about Billy for sure, right?" <laughs> But I was thinking to myself, bro, if somebody's going to be in that movie playing me, it's going to be me, dude. You know what I mean? So that was funny. And it's, it's actually funny because I think in that movie, my wife now, uh, she was actually, uh, I, I, I think she was asked to play, I think it was Scott Hatterberg's wife in the movie. So, I mean, we almost had a little bit of Swisher in there somewhere, you know? <laughs> that's crazy, though. Yeah, that's crazy. That's a good story. I love that. All right, so tell, take us through. Were you were you shocked when you got traded to the White Sox? Like, what what happened in behind the scenes in that one? And what, what did you know ahead? You know, sometimes you get a sense of you you know being traded. Did you know that they the White Sox were in the mix for for uh, uh, no, trading for you? No, that would hurt. That would hurt a lot. Um, and the only reason why is because 
as as loving of a guy as I am, I'm like, bro, I'm gonna be like Cal Ripken, bro. No doubt. I'm playing here my whole career. Like the fans in Oakland fell, you know, we, I fell in love with them. They fell in love with me. And it was just, it was perfect. Like I had just signed my deal, right? I think it was a five year with a six year on the back end of it. And I'm thinking to myself like, wow, here we go, man. I'm gonna buy a house in Oakland. I bought a house over there in Danville and Blackhawk in that gated neighborhood. I bought a place in Scottsdale for spring training. I'm like, bro, I'm setting up shop here. And then all of a sudden I get a phone call from Billy and it's like, this is the hardest phone call I've ever had to make. And I know he's made some tough phone calls in his day. I know that. Uh, I know Billy's a businessman as well, but I definitely know that that phone call was both hard for both of us, a hundred percent, because, you know, at the time I was kind of like his, like, you know, bride almost in a sense. I was kind of the guy that he was looking for, a guy that was, you know, that walked and hit home runs. I mean, that was kind of his guy. Uh, so I think that trade, I looked at it from one of two ways. I was hurt because the word loyalty really started to mean nothing to me after that. Mm. It was just like, wow, man, you really realize how much of a business this thing really is. And it hits you quick. And it, when you're a young, naive player like me, bro, I'm like, bro, these guys are going to love me forever, right? Like, I'm not going anywhere. And then you really kind of realize it's, you know, it's a lot more business oriented than a lot of people think. Um, so I think being able to be part of all that was awesome. But I also thought of it in a sense like this. Listen, if you're part of the Oakland A's and you get traded, that means you've made a name for yourself. Mm -hmm. That means right. that you've done something to get yourself, not to get yourself out of there, but for them to warrant trading you. Because right after that, if I'm not mistaken, I think I was in the Gio Gonzalez trade. Like, yes, I think Sweeney was in that one. Um, maybe a couple other guys at the time. But I was, I think I was more hurt than anything because if you look at my numbers that very next year in Chicago, um, that wasn't even – had nothing to do with the relationship with Ozzie Gian and I. I just think it was just in general it was tough, man, because I was in a new place. And listen, man, I was a power guy. I was a three, three, four, five, six guy. Then all of a sudden I show up in Chicago. They got me playing center field and leading off. And I'm like, whoa, it's a total new ball game. And rather than embracing that, I feel like I pushed it away a little bit because I was in an unfamiliar place. Maybe the relationships I had there weren't as good as I would have liked for them to be. And, you know, I mean, but I'm glad, man. I'm like, holy, you go through these tough times in life for a reason, right? Like, you don't learn anything about yourself when you're kicking ass every day. Like, you're just rolling through life. But when you hit rock bottom and you get to that bottom and it's dark, you only got one place to turn, and that's right back to yourself. And so for myself, right after that 2008 season, I took one day off that offseason and got back to work. And maybe it's a karma thing or whatever, but next thing you know, I'm on the phone with Brian Cashman saying, like, man, we believe in you. Like, we, we, we think you're going to be amazing. We know you're going to be a great Yankee. We're, we're so honored to have you. And I'm like, wait a minute, bro. Like, let, me, let me break this down. I just got my ass kicked all 2008, and now you want to bring me over to one of the greatest organizations on the planet. I'm like, I, I didn't really understand why that all took place. I just, I just went with it. Yeah. Well, you, you made a great you, you made a great four, what, four years there. I mean, yep. you know, every day lineup i mean 600 plus plate appearances every year i mean that, that's i i mean it's of course world championship first year at new yankee stadium and that had to be pretty exciting oh, in itself man. oh man i mean I, I think just in general the first day that we even got to the new yankee stadium uh we all flew in because they you know we have the the welcome home dinner every year and they took us from the welcome home dinner over to the stadium now meanwhile this is like 11 30 at night and, you know, the, the city shut down, but every light in that ballpark was on. And when we walked through the locker room and up through the tunnel onto the field, I swear to God, it was a movie. It was just like, nobody <laughs> knows what that feeling was unless you were there. And I, I was one of the lucky guys to be there and to experience that and to feel it because there are ballparks that there's ball playing and then there's ballparks that like you feel. And that was one of those ballparks that I was so blessed to be a part of. And I mean, bro, at the end of the day, man, like I, I, I give so much love to New York because it, it gave me everything I have, right? It, 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 it made me a star. It made me a champion. It, it introduced me to my wife. I'm like, I don't even know what I can say. Like, everything I got is like because of, of what New York gave me and coming from such a tough time in 2008 to such a magical year in 09, 
I mean, bro, like I believe in all, I believe in all that stuff, putting great things out in the universe, and somebody definitely had to be looking down on me for sure. You had an unbelievable run, though. When you think about it, so the Yankees pretty much every year they get in the postseason anyway, but the year before that you were in the postseason with the White Sox, all the way to 2013 with Cleveland, every single year you're, you're in the postseason. Well, I mean, that that does not happen very often, as you know. So maybe talk about that and, and how, you know, how – obviously a lot less that you were, but, but that experience is, is, uh, I mean, very yeah, rare. And you know, it's funny, man. I, I always feel like, man, I was just so blessed. I got to play in the playoffs like almost every year of my career. I was always on winning mm-hmm. teams. As a matter of fact, I think the last, you know, when I was with the Braves for a hot minute at the end there, that was the first losing team that yeah. I was on, I guess, if you, you know, in my entire career, if you look at it and, you know, I, I don't know, I, I guess I kind of pride myself on being one of those guys that you have to have in the locker room you got to be one of those guys that can bring energy each and every day. And, yeah, I may not be the best player on the squad, but, bro, I'm bringing it every day, and I'm coming because I realized in 2008 when I got benched at the end of the season and I didn't start a whole lot of games in the playoffs that year, uh, I knew that this game could be taken away from you in the blink of an eye. Mm-hmm. And, and I always remembered that because I even started the, on the bench in 09 with the Yankees because, God, remember Xavier Nady, bro, how badass he was. I mean, yeah. he was playing in front of me, rightfully so. I think he hit 28, drove in like 110 the year before. And I just realized, like, man, sitting there on the bench in Chicago with the White Sox and sitting on the bench in Baltimore on the road with the Yankees, I'm like, the game is going on 100 feet in front of me, and I'm not part of it. Like, it, it can be taken away from you at any moment. So I knew that every opportunity that I was going to get in New York, I had to produce and I had to do something because I knew, because listen, man, you guys know, like once people stop talking about you, it's over. Like, you know, shut it down, like onto the next. And so for myself, I never wanted to lose that buzz. In 2008, I lost a lot of that buzz. So once I got that opportunity to shine in New York game three, I mashed in Baltimore. I mean, like, I don't even know. It just, the ballpark felt good to me. I felt like I could leave everywhere, which made the swings calm down itself. And I went three for five, bro. Drove in five, hit a homer that game. From there, never left the lineup the rest of the season. It was a good hitter's park. Orioles Park, by the way, I thought that would be one place that you'd end up with the Orioles because you did, it seemed like you hit the hit well. Was there a part, was there like that uh, other than Camden Yards that you go, oh, man, that, that would have been a good place. For yeah, you oh, I also, play. Play. That you I also did, maybe think, too, play. I think I was realizing at that point in my career that, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to produce the same, but I would have been a great leader in the locker room. So, you know, obviously for yeah. young squads like yeah. that, I mean, you know, the Braves at the time being that squad right before they, you know, Acuna and Albies all came up, you know, in Cleveland when we had that great run with all those good teams. I mean, like, it's fun to be part of those locker rooms. It's, it's a way different vibe, man, especially when you know your career is coming to an end, coming to grips with the fact that, like, bro, you're not the everyday guy, and you may not be getting all the love that you used to get. Like, it's, it's crazy because you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about life, you know, through this crazy game. That we know. Well, 2016, 600-plus paid appearances. Obviously, 2015, uh, you know, it was over. Uh, I mean, was that, was there, was it just something that a decision you made or was it just something that you had to deal with? Yes. With the end of uh, 2014, um, I remember spring training, I made a slide and really kind of felt something jam in my knee and really didn't say a whole lot about it, but missed a lot of time in 14. I ended up having that double knee surgery at the end of that year. They peeled both my meniscus. So I've been bone on bone from that moment and tried to keep it as low pro as possible. Um, but listen, man, I mean, you guys have been in a locker room, you know, the things that players go through to play a game. And I mean, getting a turkey baster jammed in your kneecaps three times a week, just to drain them out is, Ooh. it's not a fun way of living life. And I am like the end. I'm like the, I am fun, right? Like that's kind of <laughs> like my mindset, but I've always kind of been in that, that it was just, it just got to be too much. And it, you know what, it, you know what it was doing? It was taking the love away from the game. And, yeah. and at that point, I never wanted to be one of those grisly, salty guys that was like, man, I don't like the game because it was taken from me and the whole night. Like, that's just not the way I'm going to roll, bro. That's just not who I am. Mm-hmm. So I was glad that I was able to experience that. And I was even more blessed to get sent back to the minors after 2016. Now, that was a crazy spring training because Freddie Gonzalez was my manager at that moment. And I, I, me and Freddie, we didn't get along too well. And I'm not quite sure what happened, but like, Right. At that point, I played for 10 plus years in the big leagues. 
And they released me like right before the season started. And that was like, that, I, that could have been done a little better. They could have released me to give me a little bit of time to sign on with a big league squad, but that wasn't the case. And then from there, all the rosters were set. Everybody had their rosters. And I'm like, I, I knew he did it for a reason and he got me, no doubt, but he gave me the best thing ever. He gave me the ability to go down to the minor leagues with the Yankees and be a mentor and to be a leader and to be somebody that I should have been. It's like from some of the worst times in my life have come some of the greatest moments. And I was so happy that happened now looking back on it because listen, I was part of the baby bombers, right? Like I was with all these cats. And then all of a sudden, right after I retire, my second daughter, uh, Sailor was born on June 28th, 2016. And so then literally I called Brian Cashman the, the very, or two days later, cause I think I had three days and I called him and I'm like, Cash, I'm, I'm not coming back, man. I can't do it. Like I'm staying home. And I'll never forget as I went out and I told my family, like, it was just like so many tears, bro. But like tears of like proud, happy, sad, like it's such an emotional moment. And so then from there, all of a sudden I get a call maybe a couple of weeks later from Cashman being like, hey man, I need you back. Like, I gotta have you back. And I'm like, well, what do you mean, bro? Like, I'm done. like, I'm not, I'm, I feel good. Like, anyway. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you know, I, you know I, want you, I, I, want, I want you to be an advisor for us. And you know, man, he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, bro, I, I don't know. It's like, what, my dream job? And he was like, yeah, what do you want to do? And I was like, man, I was like, I want to help the young guys. I want to go to the minor league guys and I want to be with those guys and I want to, I want to try and help them and teach them. And so Brian Cashman and Hal Steinbrenner have given me this unbelievable gift wow. of being part of the game still and still to be part of it and still to affect it and to still feel like you have a place in the game mm -hmm. and something that I take so close and I hold so near to me because – Listen, man, I'm the type of kid, like, I'm not a kid, but I just turned 40. I'm talking about like I'm a kid, right? <laughs> but if you, give me a hug, yeah. if you give me a hug, I'll run through a brick wall for you. And, you know, I think if I would have either done a better job of, you know, voicing that uh, to maybe some of my managers, we, we might have got along better. But I think, at least for myself, like, I have future aspirations to be a manager. And one of the things that I feel like one of my greatest gifts is my ability to communicate and my ability to know people and to mm. talk to them. And, you know, Jim, I mean, you knew my father back when he was coaching with the Mets yeah. in the minor leagues and even in the he big leagues, Dallas Green. Too, yeah. By the way, yeah. he was a motivator, right? And he used to tell me, he used to walk around the field every BP and he used to talk to all the guys. And I know my dad's an intense man. I know that, bro. I see him yeah. every day <laughs> and I see the snarl and the whole nine. But at the end of the day, like, I think almost in a sense, he might've been a little ahead of his time because he was who he was and he knew how to get things from place. And that's the biggest thing that a manager needs to do in today's game is to be able to get the best out of them each and every day. Because now with the algorithm, algorithms that teams have, with where analytics are coming in the game, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to give you some advice on who should be playing and where. And that's great because all that information can be taken in and help your squad. But analytics don't talk about the inside of a person. Analytics don't talk about the fight he might have just had with his wife or the fact he lost his grandmother. No one talks about all that stuff. And I think that's where managers in the future are really moving because I think it's, you noticed in basketball, we had a general manager a couple years ago got fired because he got into an argument with one of the star players. I mean, it's all about relationships in today's world. And I only think it's going to continue to moving forward in the game of baseball. Because listen, bro, you're together with each other like you know, 10 months out of the year. Like you better have some good relationships with each other because I can look back on my career and at least on all the great teams that I played on, the relationships that we had with each other, the honesty, the openness, uh, the communication that we all had was high. And so I think for myself moving forward in the next five, 10 years, whenever I decide to do this, that's obviously going to be at the forefront of, of, of what I preach. For sure. That's awesome. All right, let me ask you one more, Nick. Uh, you mentioned the baby bombers. Which one of them uh, coming up impressed you the most? Like for me, I didn't know anything about Aaron Judge. All of a sudden he comes right. out and like, whoa, where'd this guy come from? Like, was, <laughs> was he the guy or is there somebody else that, you, that kind of stood out that you knew before we did? Yeah, well, so I had seen from uh, a couple years prior being in the minor, uh, going for rehabs in the minor leagues with the Indians, I had seen Aaron Judge, and I had known who he was. Obviously, he didn't have the bat that he has now, but he had that raw size, and you don't just not see a guy that big. I think one of the guys who really impressed me kind of more than anything is Gary Sanchez. I mean, I'd never seen at the time, you know, and I know Gary's had, you know, a bunch of catching coaches over the last couple of years, and 
But I, I, I never seen a dual threat guy like that, that really kind of like a Pudge Rodriguez type that could take you deep, but throw anybody out. He had command of the pitchers, the whole nine, and he worked hard. And he was one of those guys that I'm watching the cage like, bro, who is this kid, right? Like, who is this guy? Because he's about to go up and do some damage big time. Because, I mean, like, listen, man, I came up in an era, I felt like we were strong and we were powerful. But in 2016, I'm 36 years old, bro. Like, I'm watching these 21-year-olds hit baseballs into orbit. And I'm just like, baby, it's time for me to stage right, bro, at some point in time. Because Gary Sancho is one of those guys that really stood out. I think the maturity of Aaron Judge stood out to me more than anything. Because, listen, we were in Scranton, PA. There's not a whole lot of things to do. I would have the guys over at the Waffle House every other day for breakfast, right? And we'd sit there and we'd just talk and we'd be teammates and the whole nine. And a matter of fact, we won the um, – that's crazy, man. We, we actually won the championship that year, which was cool. Me. You know what I mean? So I, I think for myself, I'm so blessed to have all those guys in my life and to learn from them because that's a whole new wave. That's a whole new era. They think about things differently than guys like me do. So to be able to learn from them early was awesome, man. And, like, I guess you can kind of tell, man, I'm just so grateful for all these, these opportunities that have come in my life because – they're molding me into the human being and the man that I am today and the things that I believe in and the things that I feel like I can help. I don't know. I mean, even be retired, bro. I mean, I'm four years retired. I'm 40. I'm like, but I'm not washed up, bro. You know? You're on the Hall of Fame like, ballot. You're on the Hall of Fame ballot. I can't kidding? believe that, man. I mean, I mean, bro, I'm thinking the same thing you are. Like, oh my gosh, what just happened? I couldn't even believe it. My buddy Fisher calls me and he's like, hey, Swish, man, have you seen, man, you're on the ballot. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, maybe they did something in our hometown or something where I can want some sort of ballot. You know? <laughs> and he's like, no, bro, the Hall of Fame ballot. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, man. So I went, I looked it up. My dad is in the Jeep with me. I'm driving with him. I'm like, dad, dad, look this up. Look this up. I don't know if it's happening or not. He looks it up and he looks at me and he's like, holy shit. It's real. Like, it's there, man. Like, you're right there front and center. And no one, no one, would, no one will appreciate that more than somebody like me to be yeah. put at the front uh, with your colleagues and all these amazing baseball players. I always tell people that there's something to be said for leaving a good mark. There's something to be said for leaving people with a great taste in their mouth. There, there really is because no doubt. If, if, you look, if you look at all the numbers, it, it doesn't seem like it should happen like that. But I think times are changing right now. And I think if you really do things the right way, that stuff ends up paying off. And, and I guess I could be that living proof guy to be like, man, <laughs> check it, bro. Like you do it right and you smile and you, you leave people with a happy thought. Like good things happen to that, you know? Definitely. Nick, what happened in uh, 2020 for you in terms of your role as senior advisor or special advisor? Did, did, you have, did you get shut down? Did you get, you know, mostly Zoom calls, no access to the ballpark? Was that part of it? And Correct. how did you, yeah, how did you, you adjust? Know, well, I was down here in Florida, so I had the ability, you know, to be in spring training and early spring training. But once everything shut down, you know, Himes, our minor league complex shut down. No one was even allowed in the facility. So from there, like you're talking, it's just phone calls, it's Zooms. It's, and for a guy like me that is very hands-on, right, like wanting to be there in the mix and literally being able to raise the energy in the room just by walking in. You know, like I wasn't able to do that this year. And that's kind of, you know, where I feel like I really slot in in the organization in the kind of the makeup department and being able sure. to, you know, read players and find out what type of guys they are. And, you know, the whole nine, that's why for myself being able, you know, being able to be part of prospect dugout and trying to, you know, read these young kids at such an early age, it's, it's crazy because people are getting broken down so early. And like, for me, I always thought, I always, I always, I always thought that if there was some sort of a test or some sort of a personality test, that people could take that would be right along with your numbers. It might make people look at things a little differently, right? You know what I mean? Sure, so, sure. Right. So I think for myself, I, I've worked with some psychologists and trying to figure out some sort of a personality test that we could put into the data and the software to not obviously give you the full spectrum of the individual, but give you a little more than some, what some numbers will give you, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm even thinking about the, you know, free agency and things like that. Like, I talked to, you know, Cashman a lot about the personalities, you know, like uh, we don't, yeah. we're lucky. We don't ever have to worry about talent in New York. It feels like it's, it's always there. I think it's just finding the X factors, the X pieces that you need to bring in to win yourself championships because we've been knocking on the door for the last decade. Right. But 
sometimes knocking ain't enough anymore. Sometimes right, we right. got to find a way to kick it in. And I feel like we're in that mode right now where, you know, we've got some great arms. We've got some great young players, some great role. You know, we got some role guys that have stepped in and done a tremendous job. So I think for myself, at least for us on the front lines, it's, it, it's awesome. Everything is, is looking great. And just finding those pieces that you can bring in to really kind of be the glue that keeps, you know, all those 25 to 45 guys you use a season uh, together. Yeah, that's great. That's well, great. Well, Bob, Bobby, you had, you had three World Series teams. And how, many, how much of those guys were – I know, Rob, I'm thinking to myself, like, those guys makeup, loved each right? other, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they had unbelievable makeup teams. I remember watching Well, them. we did. Like, come on, man. I mean, you, you know, we did. And, 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 you know, you, you look at, you, you look at the, 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 the things that people can't measure. I mean, we, you know, we, we don't win if we don't take advantage of the best data, the best information, but we also, we also had leaders on that team. I mean, you know, a, 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 a Madison Bumgarner, a, a Buster Posey, a Hunter Pence and, and some quiet leadership, you know, from the, from, from the from Matt Crawford Kane and, and, those guys and, and Crawford and right. Belt. And, but, but again, it's that environment, you know, we try to create an environment in the minor leagues where you, you, you learn to win in the minor leagues. So that when you get to the big leagues, winning is part of what you, what you do. Right. And, and I think there's like yourself, Nick, are game changers. And not, not only because you contribute on the field, but, but how you contribute off the field. And I think that's, that's a game changer. It's why you've been successful. It's, it's, it's part of the bringing out the best in the, in the guys around you. And, and that's mm-hmm. why you, I think you're, 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 you're right on to, to dream big and to look at this as an opportunity ultimately to, to manage a club and to, and to help run a team because, you know, that energy is, is needed when you're trying to go out there day in, day out for 162 games in 185 days, you've got to have people with energy. You got to have a, a, a positive way of looking at even the tough times. I, I, I appreciate that so much. That means the world to me. I, I really do. I feel like there is, um, there are guys like that out there and, you know, I mean, at least for myself, those are the guys that I want to find, right? Like, you know, the guys that can make a difference and really kind of, you know, bring that energy. Like you're saying, like, you know, listen, man, I've been so blessed. I mean, in my opinion, I'm learning from one of the best general managers to ever do the job. So to be able to be right there alongside with the decisions and the learning process, like, I don't know, maybe one of these days I want to be a GM, right? Like, I don't know. Maybe I want to be the commissioner. Like, I mean, come on, bro. Like, I, I got, I have way too much love. Uh, I know way too many people in this game. I have way too much of a passion for this to let it just slide away. No doubt. And, you know, and it's like, you guys know, I mean, look, come on, man. You guys have already had kick-ass, amazing careers, and you're still talking baseball. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, like, well done. Like no, it's it. in your blood, man. It's in your blood. You got to be, you seriously, you got to, you got to find a way to get into the manager's seat or something because, it's in your blood. I mean, I remember. So I'm going to show you this book. Uh, That's my dad's this, book. He loves that. You better believe it. Like yes, he, sir. he. Now I'm telling you, Bob. I'll tell you, sir. Like he quoted Lou Holtz, like you know, like it was his own. Like, like I, I wow. had a hard time figuring out if it was Steve Swisher <laughs> talking or Lou Holtz. Like he, I cannot believe the stuff that he he would. I'm going. What did he just say? That was unbelievable. The stuff he would come up with, and and he would bring Lou Holtz uh, isms into every clubhouse. And I'm telling you what, like I would, I still, I get chills now. No doubt, right? Me too, me too. 100%. Yeah, seriously, he'd be like, you know, I mean, yeah. just the intensity that he brought that, um, anyway, it, any of that stuff that I know you have the same passion that your dad oh, does. 100%. Like, I, hope well, you, I, mean, I hope you stay. I, 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 no doubt. I'm not going anywhere. hundred percent. You know, yeah. I mean, I got, I got two little girls, bro. So I mean, it's like. That's the balance. That's the balance. And they say to me all the time, dad, dad, we, we don't like baseball like you like baseball. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So we've started golf, gymnastics, you know, the whole nine, equestrian, horse riding, the whole thing. But you're right. I mean, my father is a walking motivational speech. You know, my dad has gone through a lot of things in his life and, you know, a lot of failures and a lot of, all, you know, right there at the top and not quite getting there. And so I think that he has taught me through that, that you have to stay motivated. You, ha- you can't let anything get you down. you got to stay true to who you are and what you are. And my dad still works with young kids now. As a matter of fact, where I think, you know, me and him are going to go into business and really try to create something special because there's a lot of intensity there. There's no doubt, but there's a lot of love. There's a lot of knowledge. And I think more than anything, kids nowadays sometimes just need, you know, somebody to put your arm around be like, Hey man, I I believe in you, you know, like I, I know you can do this. And so I think for myself, I've been blessed to have a father in my life. Listen, bro, he played in the big leagues for 10 years. Like, 
me and my dad are like the third or fourth ever father-son combination drafted in the first round. We both played in an all-star game. Like, I got a World Series. He right. don't. But still, it's he just like, <laughs> oh, you, you don't tell I mean? him. You, you don't use it. Again. But 10 I don't plus use that years, ever. I never bring that up. Never, never. It never comes up at dinner table. <laughs> 10 plus years, both of you. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, it like, really is. And, 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 you know, I mean, for what I want to do in the future, it's nice to be able to be there and, and to have somebody right there on your side that, number one, wants nothing but the best for me and my family. But also, too, has been through the grind and understands kind of how that is because, you know, it doesn't always end up great. And so for me, it's I've always grinded for everything I've ever had in my entire life. And I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So to be like, you guys don't even know how juiced up I was to talk to you guys because <laughs> like guys like you are leaders. And that's how I view front office as leaders, just like I do in any sort of company. The people at the top, regardless of who they are, they have to set the tone of what you're doing. And for both of you guys, for the careers that you guys have had, you set the tone. And I just want to give you guys a little love for that because I'm like, bro, like those people, those, those, those people that you have in your corner, they don't come along very often. You don't have people that uh, are in there with the team as much and like want the best for everybody. You know, some people may have some other intentions, but for guys like you to be as successful as you guys have and to still keep going and to still keep that knowledge flowing – like guys like me, we soak that up for sure because <laughs> you always learn from people that are better than you. And, you know, being able to kind of be on this call with you guys, bro, is badass to me because I'm like, bro, I'm going to take a lot of things away from this. <laughs> oh, we appreciate you uh, coming you're on. You're great, man. Uh, you're great. Yeah, oh, the energy. We love the energy. Uh, stay in touch, please. Uh, please tell your dad. Listen, the, the reason why I became GM was a lot of it was how much I learned from your dad. I'm t I tell you, that, please pass it on. I miss him. Will, Last I time I, to I was together, I was the farm director with the Astros, and he was our AAA manager for a couple of days. He went through, you know, the tough time that yeah, with we, the we were talking about yep. with his efforts. Yep. And and I remember, I still remember when he called me up and said he had to, he had to, he had to resign, he had to quit. And I, you know, I was like, oh my god, it's like the worst thing ever for me. I don't know how that, you know, yeah, like, he was, was my friend. He was coming back home. I was happy. Yeah, you were going to see him, and I wasn't. <laughs> you know, I was selfish. Uh, but but I do please. Please, uh, I will, man. You know, I will. he had a really huge influence it. on me over the years. He really did. So I, I love him. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that you gave us the time today. We really appreciate it. Oh, my it. God. Awesome. I mean, guys, I can't thank this enough, man. I, I love this yeah. stuff. Uh, I feel like uh, we've got the greatest game in the world. And it's okay to to look at the game a little differently. It's okay. Like, things are going to get better. Like, you know, I mean, you know, you, we got to stay up with it, right? Everything is evolving. Right. And exactly. you know, if you want to be part of the game, then these are the things that are happening. And for somebody like me, listen, I don't like a baseball historian. I know the game from front to back because that's just how I was raised. But like, this is like a new chapter in the game. And it's just, it's going to be right. just as awesome as the ones yeah. before. So I feel like for a lot of people that maybe are pushing off this new way of baseball, don't, don't, don't judge a book by its cover because I feel like, you know, in due time, people realize that, you know, this might be the better way of playing it. It's going to be great. fun.